Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're gonna be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I gonna marry? What kind of life am I gonna live? How am I gonna raise my kids? What am I gonna do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Hey, welcome to another week of the choices we face. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, this program and our next program because our guest is Pastor James Ward Jr. And he's written a fabulous book called Zero Victim, Overcoming Injustice with a New Attitude. And Pastor Ward, welcome to the program. Hey, Ralph, it's so good to be with you. Thanks for having me. I'm really, really grateful. Well, it's really here. great to have you. I remember we first met on a Zoom call. Uh, a friend, a Catholic friend, felt we should get connected, and we, we got connected. And then you began to get involved with Legatus, uh, a national Catholic organization for chief executives. And you were here in Ann Arbor at the national office of Legatus, which our headquarters is just down the hallway. And we met, and you gave me a copy of your book. And... Uh, I just feel like this is the most hopeful thing I've heard, wow. given the terrible, terrible divisions right now in our country. And when I was reading the book, though, what really struck me is how the Lord from your mother's womb yeah. kind of prepared you and called you and put you in a family context and, 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 and all the other things. So I'm wondering if we could just begin in this first program. Just tell me a little bit about yourself. You were born... And then what happened? Sure, yeah. And uh, you, you mentioned that, um, you know, Jeremiah chapter 1, you know, you read this conversation and get some insight into God speaking to Jeremiah and telling him, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I sanctified mm -hmm. you and ordained you and set you apart. You know, I think that's such a missing part of life right now and why families are so important, why faith is so important. We don't show up in this life and then God kind of uh, scratches his head or roll the dice or spin the wheel to figure out what it is that we're called to do. And I think David even writes that all of my days are written in the books that God has for me. And I'm beginning to live that. I'm beginning to appreciate that. Um, this message comes out of my soul. It comes out of uh, my heart. I originally wanted to write about something else and I have a great friend, a spirit-filled friend. And as he listened to me talk, he says, James, that's not your message. This zero victim thing is your message, mm -hmm. and um, he was he was he was right. Uh, growing up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, in the South, at the very tail end of um, a segregated school system, uh, even in the in the early '80s, um, I remember the day, uh, Dr. Ralph, when uh, we were notified that our schools were going to be integrated, and in third grade, living on the black side of town. Uh, Tuscaloosa is geographically divided by the Black Warrior River, so pretty much the white people on the north side, black people on the south. And so to take a bus ride and to have to go to school on the white side of town, that was going to be a problem. You didn't do that. Mm. And honestly, I don't recall even, even seeing any white students before third grade, now that I, I think, think back. Mm -hmm. um, but making that bus ride to the, to the white side of town uh, was a transformative experience. But growing up in a household of faith, uh, having a father who was a deacon, a traditional praying grandmother, grandparents, mm -hmm. my mom was um, a believer at that time. It really created the right environment uh, that the Lord could really begin to prepare my heart, I think, for that experience and beyond until this this very time. Yeah, well, you know, I was really impressed with the uh, warmth and love that you were expressing to your family yeah. as, as you dedicated the book and opened it up and how you were grateful for who they were and yeah. the parents that God gave you and the father that God gave you. And uh, you could just kind of feel the love and the blessing there. Yeah. It's really, really inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. One of, one of the things that is most dear to my heart is family. And even now uh, the restoration of black families in America, yes. you know, there's so many challenges in the black community. And I don't think we're making the correlation and the right connection 
to the disintegration of the, the traditional family in the black community yeah. and the adverse ref effects that are having. And many times, you know, again, with this more victim-minded culture, we're quick to point at other issues and other stimulus in life to say, well, that's the problem. And we're not coming back to, to the roots of the family. I remember one of the most distinctive, uh, transformative, most powerful moments in my life as I was traveling with my dad. I don't even remember where we went, just the two of us in a hotel room. And I woke up early in the morning and kind of rolled over and opened my eyes. And I saw my father on his knees, kneeling next to his bed in the hotel room, praying. And doctor, that, that really opened my heart to know that it was okay to serve God. It was okay to pray. But seeing my father mm. uh, do that, my hero, my role model yeah, pray, yeah. that really inspired me to do so and to follow in, yeah. in his footsteps. Well, I think there's just a lot of heroes, a lot of hidden heroes like that. Yeah, hidden heroes. You know, who are just taking care of grandchildren and, mm -hmm. you know, and just sacrificing their lives and just praying and loving and enduring great suffering oftentimes, you know, it's going to be wonderful to see in heaven yes. the Lord rewarding, you know, right. all, all that hidden Love and all that hidden sacrifice, yeah. Hidden heroes, I love that. Yeah, yeah. But I know something really significant happened when you went across the river, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, to another school. Yeah. Yeah, T tell us about what happened. So this, this journey, which became a life-changing journey. So as we're making this trek across the river, the first thing I began to notice is that the landscape changed. You know, on our side of town, the black side of town, you have um, old cars kind of jacked up on cinder blocks and there's you know litter in the streets but as you as i crossed the river the homes had well manicured lawn lawns and the landscaping was great just a different environment and immediately i began to say in my heart you know i want to be on this side of town this is where i belong i feel i felt as though something on the outside was beginning to align with something that was on the inside you know environment is very important you get to the to this new school the new newly built school um, all the playground equipment was new, mm. all in working order. At our school, some of the equipment was broken down, but the, the lighting, the school was very bright, very well lit, uh, fresh smell of paint, you know, new chalkboards. That environment, it does something to you. And I began to feel like my outside was catching up to my inside. Mm. Was really grateful that I didn't know it, but again, this is just God's providence. My third grade teacher was a black lady who happened to be a friend of my grandmother. She mm. was a the wife of, a, of an AME pastor from, mm -hmm. the, from the, uh, a black church. And you're a street. pastor yourself right now, right? I am right now. Yeah, yeah. Right, right in the Chicago yeah. area? Yep, just, uh, just north of Chicago. Yeah, what's the name of the church? Of that you... The church is Insight Church. Okay. Yep, and uh, we just are going through right now uh, another church that's involved with us. It's merging into our churches, so we're expanding, okay. which is great. Okay. But this, this yep. you know, lady was, uh, Mrs. Fitz was my third grade teacher. Um, very, very poised. Her posture was different. She was very eloquent. Her hair was never out of place, and she her, she stood erect, and her feet were together. She was very soft-spoken, and just her posture made an impression on me. And I later found out that this was a part of uh, not only God preparing me, but uh, she had pioneered this integration mm -hmm. and had worked some things out. And so to have her as my teacher was a blessing. And I, I remember she would put our names on the board whenever we did well in school. Uh, most times you get your name, you get recognition when you're not doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah. But if you did well on a spelling test, she would put your name on the board. Uh, she tended to be a little hard on me for some reason. I think knowing the space that I was in and trying to cultivate me, she was a little difficult on me. But my name would always be on the board for doing well. And the significance of that is that um, I began to recognize that as I'm doing well, that the white kids that I thought could be my enemies were not against me. They were not holding me back. They were not hindering me from being successful. And something clicked, which I really believe was the spirit of God in my heart, to help me disarm the hostilities around me, to recognize that I'm not a victim and the people around me are not against me. And from that time until this moment, I don't believe in white supremacy because I don't believe in black inferiority. Mm, something mm, changed mm. in me, yeah. not around me. Something had changed in me that changed the world around yeah. me. And that was the genesis and the seed planted for the Zero Victim book. I know. Some, some of the things I'm hearing these days, Pastor, seem so condescending and insulting to black people. I mean... It absolutely is. Like, like, it's, like it's like you're supposedly against racism, but what you're saying is incredibly racist. It's yeah. like you don't think that black yeah. people, right. you know, right. can get photo ID or, yeah, you know, or, or yeah. you know, or can show up on time at work or yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's like... like do you realize what a horrible 
white superiority attitude yeah. you're communicating yeah. Yeah. there? Yeah. That's you know? exactly it, you know, because what it does is it robs you of your dignity. Yeah. And it forces this codependency, and it's it's more of a slave mindset now than sometimes even physically being enslaved when you're controlling the thought process and you rob an individual of their identity, their capability. You know, we're not just here to be res responders to a stimulus like test animals in a test lab. Yeah. We're thinking, functioning people who were created in the image of God. Yeah. And we never hear a voice speaking to our purpose, but it always speaks to our pain. Yeah. And you can never you can never be free and never be liberated. I, I know. That's that's revolutionary. Yeah. And and I, I almost can't believe what's happening in the desire to fix past wrongs, it's almost like they're being perpetuated in a new form. You That's know? Correct. Yeah, they really are. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. really. Well, tell us more about what happened, what got planted in you uh, in the third grade, what happened after in your life, you know, sure. just, yeah. Yeah, from that experience, again, it changed um, the trajectory of my life. You know, I think trajectory is so important and um, our, our mind um, you know, really, really being aligned with scripture, I think creates the tracks and the trajectory that our life travels on. And from that moment, um, I've had the most high quality relationships with people of all ethnicities. Our church is, is diverse, I travel the nations and have a different perspective. For example, um, if someone asked me, I, I refer to myself as black American and not African American. Okay. Because I've, I've been to Africa many times, there's 53 or 54 different countries or so, all individual and distinct in Africa, everyone has its own culture and its own mm -hmm. um, you know, unique language in some cases. And so African-American is really a misnomer. I think it even contributes to, I'm not being dogmatic about this, but I think it even con contributes to identity crisis and specificity. Well, I appreciate you telling me I'm that. I'm an because, American. I appreciate you telling me that because a lot of us white people don't know what to say anymore. You know, yeah, yeah. we don't know. And I don't know what to say either. I don't... <laughs> yeah, but okay. Yeah. Black. Yeah. But okay. I, I say black American because black American, this, is, this yeah. is my nature. But what I mean by that, it, it, I take ownership of my nation. I don't feel like I'm an outsider. I don't feel like I'm deprived. This is this is my home. Amen. And um, I, I refer to it that way. So that mindset has guided me. And I, the, the where I got the the actual book title Zero Victim is I was working again in a multicultural church. We took an attitudinal assessment as a senior staff, and one of the categories to which uh, you're scored in this attitudinal assessment is the degree to which you see yourself as a victim. Well, I scored in the victim category zero, <laughs> and the guy who facilitated the exam and says, you know what, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've never seen anybody score. Everyone has some degree of victim. I needed to meet you. I needed to find out what's behind this, and I told him about third grade. And so I, I say that I'm certified and I'm documented. I have credentials that I'm zero victim. <laughs> wow, you know, you're, you're a free man. Absolutely. You, you got delivered from an oppressive lie, didn't you? That's correct. Yeah. 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 And, and you're trying to help other people get, yeah. get yeah. delivered from an oppressive lie by, mm -hmm. by speaking the word of God. And, 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 and the that's power the ministry of Christ. It is. Whom the Son is made free. Yeah, he broke down it's the walls, he didn't he? He broke down that middle yeah. wall, Ephesians 2. Gentile and Jew, he that's brought together, right. yeah. 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 Even even the zero victim mind of Christ, um, you know, Dr. Ralph is. Call me Ralph, by the way. I'll yeah, call yeah, you Ralph. Yeah. Sure. Before so, before I was a doctor, I used to be Ralph, but that's what I pretty much identify myself sure, as. Yes. Yeah. So so I say the zero victim mind of is the mind of Christ. Zero victim mentality is the mind of Christ, and I explain it this way: the only innocent man that ever lived suffered the greatest injustice that the world yeah. ever known of being brutally crucified for other people's sins and not his own. If that's not injustice, I don't know what is. Yeah. But yet, while in the act of still being uh, victimized, he's already praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that is the standard for how we deal with injustice and we deal with challenges in our life. Any other injustice is a lesser infraction and a lesser injustice when measured by that, that standard yeah. really releases love and forgiveness. You see that operating in Stephen's life in Acts chapter seven. Mm -hmm. He's being stoned and while being stoned, he's saying, Father, yeah. don't charge this to them. You know, you see it in Joseph's life. Yeah. And I really think that even as believers, we have to rediscover that this zero victim mindset is a mindset of Christ and then begin to uh, make disciples of nations to actually export it. And so uh, I'm very hopeful that this is 
I, I really believe it's it's a solution yeah. to what's happening. There's so much commentary about what's going on, but I believe that this is a solution for it. Yeah, well, you know, I, I agree because the divisions are so strong and they're so filled with hate, you know, and, and so filled with fear and, and deception. And uh, you can say, is, is, there, is, there, is there another way besides yeah. division and hatred? Is, is there another way besides outrage, you know? I mean... Mm -hmm. You know, everything that happens, people say, I'm outraged about it. You know, I'm outraged yeah. about it. And it's yeah. just like, where are we going to get if we just keep getting outraged and yeah. don't look for a path to a solution? And yes. I, I feel I feel so grateful that you're 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 showing us a way that mm -hmm. that isn't power and isn't politics and isn't gaining control and isn't beating somebody else down, you know, type of thing. Yeah. yeah. I, I just read today in my little news feed that there's, there's a professor in uh, South Africa uh, who's proposing that white people should commit suicide, oh, you know, because oh, we really oh. need to get the only way to get rid of white privilege is get rid of whites, you know, type of thing, you know. So yeah. I'm saying, well, you know, I wonder, I wonder if there couldn't be another solution than, than extermination of one race, you know, type of yeah. thing, you know, type of thing. Oh, but but that's how crazy that right. we're, we're, we're right. in this right. type of yeah. thing. So, yeah. 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 The mystery of iniquity. Yeah. You know, it, it, when you speak about those things, the, I mean, just the charges of, you know, white privilege, you know, critical race theory. Yeah. Those those are all rooted. The soil from which critical race theory grows is victim thinking, is victim mentality. Yeah. And if we don't go to the root of it, those things only prosper and fester because we're dealing with the soil, but we're not dealing with the soil um, of victim thinking and acknowledging that in our in our nation. And, yeah. um, we've got we got to go back to the heart. Jeremiah chapter 17 says that the the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Yeah. We have a sin problem in our nation and not a skin problem. You know, racism is the fruit. Sin is the root. And if you don't kill it at the root, the fruit are going to continue to grow back. Even if you pick them off the tree, they're going to keep growing back if you don't deal <laughs> yeah. with the root. We got to go to the heart. Well, you know what? That that is a great line. We got a sin problem, not a skin problem. That's I correct. think yeah. that's yeah. fabulous. No, no, we don't need any white people committing suicide. That's not going to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. You know. You know. People hear a lot about critical race theory today, and I think everybody's a little fuzzy about what what exactly is that. How would you describe yeah. what people are sure. doing when they use that language? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, when you talk about critical race theory and get into you know cultural hegemony and these kinds of things. There are these philosophies that that racism um, is literally uh, innate in the system itself; that it's inherent in the system, and you can't you can't redeem the system because racism is so ingrained. You have to destroy the system altogether and rebuild it. Mm -hmm. And I think that is dangerous um, because now you're talking about fundamentally redefining the United States of America. And in any situation, just because something is is damaged or or, or not being utilized or managed the right, right way, you don't destroy it, you know, and get rid of it. You you redeem it, you fix it. And so I think we're at this crossroads right now that the the overall critical race theory is a dismantling of the system and rebuilding it, which is a dangerous thing. Uh, I think it's Psalm 11, you know, three or so says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Yeah. We've got to hold on to our foundations. Yeah, and as, um, as imperfect as the United States is, there was some attention to God in the founding. Yes. There was some desire for true justice, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. Yeah. And and even at the beginning, they couldn't solve everything because the South wouldn't give up slavery, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But 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 John Adams and all those people said, We're not gonna have slavery in the North, we're not yeah. gonna have slavery in the Ohio Territory, we're not gonna let it expand. And so there was there was a battle there at the beginning, but there was at least some common looking to God yeah. that allowed a solution to emerge later on type of Absolutely. thing. Absolutely, you know? yeah. I'm yeah. I'm thankful. Um, you know, in the days of Joseph, God takes things that were meant for evil and he uses them for good. So I, I'm even thankful for the Middle Passage and, and, and black Africans, Africans coming to America. And if we had time to talk, I would talk about how that in and of itself was an expression of God's salvation because even you hear this notion that Jesus is a white man's Jesus. No, he's not. You read about the, the historical nature of Christianity in Ethiopia, which long preceded the United States of America. Yeah. But even historically, blacks were, were being slaughtered by Muslims even during that time. And the fact that the Lord brought some Christians with their faith to the United States to meet some Christian slave owners, that even though things weren't perfect, we were able to practice our faith. And I think that even now, uh, black Americans have so much to offer in the area of spirituality in America that if we could find a place of forgiveness, 
and really begin to release the love of God over our nation, I think that we'll experience an awakening yeah. in our nation like we've never seen before. And that's yeah. my heart. That's your heart. And that's one of the yeah, things that really yeah. well, it's uh, almost, engages it's us. It's almost like what Martin Luther King was doing yes. has been hijacked by... That's correct. Has been hijacked yeah. Yeah. by all kinds of causes mm -hmm. that have nothing to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With, with civil rights. And just, yep. it's almost like people with an agenda are, are, are using... Yes. That achievement, which was really a Christian achievement, you know, sure it, was. And it really was. He was a pastor and he had his faults, but he mm -hmm. he was really trying to do this other way, yeah. this yeah. way of forgiveness, this yeah. way of unity. You know, I'm so glad you brought up Dr. King because I've I've actually shared in one of the ways I talk about the zero victim book and even some of the social services initiatives that are associated with it. I say that Dr. King had a dream, but we have a vision. Mm -hmm. Dreams happen when you're asleep. But, but visions happen when you've been awakened. Mm. I think this is a time of awakening and for us to mobilize this dream into a, an actionable vision. And I believe we need a new movement, that this new zero victim message is a new zero victim movement yeah. based upon the love of God and liberty yeah. and freedom that can move our nation forward. And so that is, that is our prayer. Right? Let's do it. Yes. Let's do it. Let's, let's, let's do all we can to, uh, yes. to spread this message. Let's, yeah. let's tell people how they can get the book. Sure. Yep. Can they get it on Amazon? You can get it on Amazon. The Kindle uh, version is, avail is available there. And also just from our, our website, zerovictim.com. Okay. It helps our ministry sure. when you buy it from our yeah, website. Yeah, it's better to buy it from their that's, website that's right. than Amazon. So we don't want to... Zerovictim.com. We don't want to give Amazon any more power than they have, right? It, you know, yeah, they're, right. they're censoring people. They're <laughs> knocking people off. They're not carrying that's certain true. people's books because yeah. they're speaking against this. But fortunately, they can get it there still. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. best to get yep. it from your website. Zerovictim.com. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to have an opportunity with Peter Herbeck in our next next week's program to go into more of these issues. But I'm wondering if there's anything like you'd like to say personally to people watching today, anything about what they could do or or what attitudes they could have or sure. what, what examination they need to do in their own life. Maybe just speak right to the camera sure. from your heart to folks who are listening yeah, today. I, I, w I would love to. And um, to, to say, first of all, that I'm, I'm praying for our viewers, that we're, we're praying for uh, God's grace to be upon your upon your life. And if you think about this, the power of zero victim mindset is responding responsibly instead of reacting by reflex. We find ourselves in life, the world is perfectly designed to make victims out of all of us. Um, it doesn't, you know, I'd like to say sometimes the devil doesn't discriminate in terms of who he's out to steal and kill and destroy from. Life is perfectly designed to make victims out of all of us. The important thing is not what you're going through, but how you go through it. A victim-minded person will always react by reflex, but a zero victim-minded uh, person will always respond with reason. And there's a space between a stimulus and a response. And in that space, uh, we have choices to make. In that space, we need the grace of God. Uh, we can't stop the unjust stimulus from happening, but we can control how we respond. And I pray that this book would be a guide, a companion to God's word to help you develop the mind of Christ. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 tells us that we are transformed. We're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. God changes us uh, at the level of our heart and also the level of our mind. And I pray that this resource would be a great uh, tool to, uh, for you and with you to help you always act and never react. To the circumstances that you have to deal with in life. That's really great. Well, let's let's pray now. Let's pray for our country, right? Yes. Let, let's pray for those who are watching and listening right now. But let's pray for the Lord of mercy in our country and Amen. show us a better way. Amen. Like Paul says, I show you a more excellent way, you know. We Lord, we thank you for our country yes. with all its faults. And mm -hmm. we should have mercy on us, Lord, and rescue us and save us. You, yes. you said in your word that if your people humble themselves, that you will heal our land. Lord, we ask for healing for our land, healing for our nation, healing for people who are suffering because they're locked in hostility with each other. Yes. And you want to deliver them, Lord. You want to break down the dividing wall yes. like you did between Jew and Gentile. You want to do it between black and white. You want to do it between Republicans and Democrats. You want to do it between North and South. You want to do it between all the races, Lord, you want to make one new man in you, Lord. We ask you to have yes. mercy on us and continue to bless Pastor Ward and continue to raise him up and continue to help him to be a voice forward. Lord, we thank you for him and we thank you for this ray of hope, this light of hope you're giving us today. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord.
Yeah. Amen. Thank you. I yeah. agree with that prayer. Yeah. Well, thank thank you. you. Well, thank you for being with us. I'm glad you can join us next week also in our next yes. program where we can I'm get honored. more, thank more you. into these issues. Yeah. Well, I've written a booklet. It's called Join the Resistance. And I think after the program today, we even know more what we need to resist. We need to resist hatred. We need to resist reacting in kind to things that happen to us. We need to resist the victim mentality. Uh, we need to know that we're free men and women in Jesus Christ and that the Lord has a path for us. The Lord has a light for us. He really is the light of the world. And we'd like to make this booklet available to you at no cost just for the asking. It's called Join the Resistance. Join the resistance against hatred. Join the resistance against division. Be a peacemaker as Jesus asks us to be. If you, go, if you kind of call the 800 number or go to our website, renewalministries.net, we'll give it to you. So Jesus, uh, the scripture says, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. So Pastor Ward and myself want to say, we're going to resist the devil. We're going to resist hatred. We're going to seek a more excellent way. We're going to make love our way. And I wish that that could be true for you also. But that means examining our conscience. That means looking at our life. That means asking God for forgiveness for any ways in which we've given into hatred or given into hostility. And just really ask the Lord to deliver us from the pain and deliver us from the lies and the deception of the devil so that we can may really walk in peace and walk in love. Amen. Join the resistance. I'm only talking about resisting one thing the lies of the devil working through our corrupt culture that are intended to drag us and the whole human race to ruin. There's no way of explaining the radical changes in our culture and even in our church without recognizing the work of the evil one. This booklet identifies some of the main lies we encounter and gives us tools to recognize and resist them. As scripture says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So ground yourself ever more deeply in the personal love of Jesus and the absolute truth of his teaching. Ask him for the courage and wisdom needed. And from that place of trust and confidence, join the resistance. I'm in a good place in my life. And I'm energized by new adventures. I've got friends to laugh with and a good relationship. But even though I'm kind of comfortable, I sometimes wonder, is there something more? Could God in church be what you're looking for? Come and see at catholicscomehome.com.